perfect roast potato. It's not just a potato, this is the perfect roast potato. And if you think I'm going mad, it's because I'm mad for roast potatoes. Crispy outside and fluffy inside. We're gonna do it three ways. Goose fat potatoes, butter, clementine, rosemary, garlic, and extra virgin olive oil. The Maris Piper is an incredible, incredible potato. Fluffy and starchy. The peeling of the potatoes, you don't need to see that. I've got them parboiling in here in salted boiling water. They're kind of that size. Cook them for about 10 minutes. The best roast potatoes I've ever made have come from a time when I almost felt I'd overcooked them and created mashed potato, okay? So you need to tread that line very, very, very carefully. So I can see they're just kind of thinking about breaking up. Pour it into the colander. This steaming part here now is also incredibly, incredibly important. It's starting to get starchy, see it go kind of fluffy and white and little kind of flecks and flakes of broken bits of potato. These are the things that are gonna give you crispy bits and we love crispy bits and a crispy outside, okay? Really, really important. In tray number one, cold pressed extra virgin olive oil. Three tablespoons, lower in saturated fats, so we love that. We're gonna move on, butter and olive oil. Half as much and then a nice knob of butter. Butter's gonna give you incredible flavor and a sort of lovely sweetness. But also, a strong contender for gorgeousness is goose fat. You can get it in all the supermarkets, three or four tablespoons in there, you're gonna get a richer flavor. It could be pork fat, it could be beef tallow. I love all of them, but I generally sway for the butter and the olive oil. But at Christmas, I kinda go for the goose fat because it's so good. A little secret ingredient that I do a swig, tablespoon, of red wine vinegar. It will disappear and what's left is a really subtle kind of tang. It just helps make the perfect roast potato. Then herbs. So let's go to the olive oil here. Get in some lovely rosemary. Put it under a hot tap. If you put it under a hot tap, it just wakes up the natural oils in the rosemary. Okay, so rosemary goes in. And of course, best friends with garlic. Leave the skin on. The skin will protect the garlic and it will release the garlicness very gently. The whole bulb of garlic. Trust me, guys. Then we're gonna go to the olive oil and butter. Sage is a classic. Beautiful, beautiful fragrant herb. That goes in. And then we've got clementine. You could use any citrus fruit, but at Christmas, uh, clementine's particularly good. Just the zest, lovely. That will make a difference. It's gonna be really, really good. Last but not least, goose fat. Just go brave on bay leaves. Dried ones are okay, fresh, amazing. Four, five, six, and then go in with some thyme. We're gonna hit these up with some salt and pepper, olive oil, rosemary, garlic, clementine, uh, butter, olive oil and sage, and bay, thyme and goose fat. Delicious. Now back over here. While these little bad boys are steaming hot, right, we need to chuff them up. Scratching and scraping the edge. Chuffing, right? I've made it up, okay? Look what I'm doing, look what I'm doing. Woohoo! You see how I've beaten that up, right? So that's good. So we're gonna go in, while they're hot, just mix up all of these. Absolutely gorgeous. So I'm gonna cook these in an oven at about 180, 190, which is about 350 Fahrenheit. Over the period of about 50 minutes, maybe an hour, they're gonna get gorgeous and golden and crispy. But after about 40 minutes, I wanna show you the last little tip to make these incredible. Take the tray out of the oven after 40 minutes, place the potato masher on top, and then just let it pop and let the lovely starchy inside just puff out and then create a flatter surface area on the bottom and the top. Just do that around the whole tray and then pop it back in for another 10 minutes. You can hear the sizzle. Have a little shake up. You can see and you can hear there is crispy perfection in the house. Goose fat potatoes, the butter potatoes with the clementine. The smell in this room is off the chart. And last but not least, the rosemary, garlic, and extra virgin olive oil. Crispy, fluffy, perfect, tangy, little gorgeous oh, roast potatoes. Hi guys, okay, I'm gonna show you how to make a really simple but really delicious braised red cabbage. It's an amazing dish from my new cookbook, Jamie's Christmas, with fennel seeds, clementine, balsamic vinegar, smoky bacon, and rosemary. People are gonna go crazy for it on Christmas day, or in actual fact, any time of the year. First up, I've got a nice whole red cabbage. This is about a kilo in weight. I've taken the tatty outside leaves off. Smoky bacon here, 
So first job, slice it up, and I'm using a kind of casserole style pan on a medium heat. So bacon in, and we're gonna fry this off with about a tablespoon of olive oil. Then we're gonna render out the beautiful natural fat from the bacon. Beautiful. Uh, what I'm gonna do is split this red cabbage very carefully in half. Roughly and finely slice the red cabbage. The stalk, I'm just gonna literally slice up in any old way. I think this is one of the cheapest vegetables that you can buy. I think, personally, that a lot of people think that red cabbage is like a frumpy, boring veg. Absolutely no way. Delicious. Now, I can hear that the bacon is changing sound. It's starting to get golden if you look in there. And when it's getting lightly golden, I'm gonna add two or three big sprigs of rosemary go in and I want the rosemary to absorb all of that lovely fat from the bacon. And the rosemary's then gonna go really, really crispy. So look at this guys, the rosemary goes deep green and starts to go equally crispy, just like the bacon. I'm gonna remove the rosemary and the bacon with a slotted spoon and I'm gonna leave behind the fat, right? In here, look at that, that's all smoky bacon fat. I'm gonna take a little knob of butter, put that in there. We're gonna go in with two teaspoons level of fennel seeds. Have a look at these. These are my favorite spice. I use it so often and it's really, really good. So I'm just gonna tear in some prunes, a little handful. These have the most incredible dynamic flavor. They will completely disintegrate into nothing. And then I'm gonna go in with the red cabbage. One or two nice apples, roughly chop it. This will give amazing sweetness to this dish without having to use like loads of brown sugar and stuff like that. Look at the color guys, the amazing purple against the white of the apples. I'll add a nice little pinch of salt and pepper. And then there's one last ingredient. So I'm gonna add about eight to 10 tablespoons of balsamic vinegar. And we're gonna cook it all away. So guys, it might seem like a lot of balsamic vinegar, but please just trust me, when that cooks away, it's gonna bring all the flavors together. So you've got the sweet and the sour of the vinegar and the apples and the prunes, you know, with all those spices and the smoky bacon, it's gonna be delicious. So lid on, medium heat, 25 minutes. I'll stir that every five minutes. So, see you in 25. So this has had 25 minutes. It's a phenomenal color. You might want to add just a little bit more fresh butter just to kind of help join all the flavors. And then if you wanted to, you can just use a classic Christmas flavor like clementine. And that's the last thing, the last bit of sweetness um, that kind of stops the frying. Look at that. It's just a beautiful thing. Of course, cabbage is incredibly good for you, but we've made this so desirable, so delicious. And then don't forget the rosemary and the crispy bacon bits. Absolutely gorgeous. That'll feed, as a side dish, 10 people. Easy peasy. Really nice. Tender, but the crunch from the bacon still there and the rosemary. An absolutely beautiful red cabbage dish. If you want more red cabbage inspiration, hit the eye box up there. Aaron Kays has done a beautiful cabbage slaw with a bit of a twist. And don't forget, if you have leftovers of this, you can kind of redress it like a salad and have it with beautiful leftover things like, you know, your hams, your meats, and your cheeses, and that kind of like Boxing Day fare. So there you go, red cabbage, but not as you know it. Until next time, lots of love. Hello, lovely people. Okay, we're gonna make the best gravy in the world, oh yes, it's gonna be a beautiful thing. Okay, so whether you're cooking beef, roast beef, roast pork, roast turkey at Christmas, goose, chicken, ducks, game birds, it doesn't matter what you're cooking, I'm gonna give you principles that will serve you and your family really, really well and give you the most extraordinary gravy every single time. Before I started roasting off this beautiful turkey right here, um, I just had an empty tray, just cut up some onions. Leave the skin on, that's fine. Don't bother peeling the carrots, just wash them, hack them up, chunky. The giblets often come with any poultry. Get it in there, it's the key to incredible flavor. I've got some rosemary, that's job done. Now the purpose of that is to lift the bird or the meat off the bottom of the roasting tray uh, and to absorb all the flavors that cook, the sticky goodness that cooks out of it, we need a little jam jar. 
we need to separate off the fat. So fat always floats to the surface. Look, if I get a little bit of juice in here, you can see the difference, yeah? And this fat will keep in your fridge for months and months and months. You can put herbs in there if you want. It's a blessing in disguise, don't waste that. So once you've got the fat out, just put it on a high heat and bring it to the boil, okay? You wanna just reduce down the juices. When you're roasting lovely cups of meat, uh, it's good to have a high-sided, snug-fitting tray, okay? If it's just really thin and massive, everything's gonna kind of scald. You can see, because it's a bit snugger and a bit higher, see all the juice we've got. We've got amazing juice and flavor. Now, your tray might look a little drier than this, and that's fine as well because you'll probably have sticky bits of goodness on the bottom. I've tried to break it down to three principal levels to get you from here to incredible gravy. Do we thicken it? Do we want to thicken it? We've got corn flour, which you can use, or just normal plain flour. Your choice, it's all good. But then there's a couple of kickers, guys. We've got jam here. Jam, a little thimble, a couple of teaspoons of jam helps to add incredible sort of silk and sweetness and tang. And the thing to rift off of that sweetness is acid. So see here, acid comes in lots of different forms. Vinegar, uh, Worcestershire sauce, balsamic vinegar, beer. So first up, acid. What are we thinking? Roast turkey, I'm thinking Christmas. Um, oh, maybe roast pork is the best thing to do. You know, 100 mils, just like half a wine glass, not a lot. Use this liquid to scrape all the goodness off the side. We're using alcohol. You cook that away. It's Christmas, it's turkey, a couple of teaspoons of quince goes in. So this is exciting, guys. This is really exciting. Certainly in Britain, we love to thicken a gravy. We want a bit more body there, okay? You know, for a turkey, for a tray this size, I'm gonna go in with three teaspoons plain flour. I don't want any lumps, just move it and let the flour soak up all that flavor. It smells incredible. That's nice and thick now. I'm adding stock here, guys. You could add water because there's so much flavor from the turkey uh, and the giblets. I'm gonna really almost overfill this tray. And that's why it's really nice to have a nice high-sided roasting tray. Basically, the longer you leave it to reduce and go thick and dark, it will go 10 times more tasty. So I'm gonna let this simmer now for about half an hour, then we'll come and have a look. You can see it's really watery and kind of fairly ugly now. In half an hour, that's gonna be a different story. Beautiful. That is about 20, 25 minutes, and you can see it looks dark, rich. It's thickened up beautifully, so now we need to pass it. When you've got the gravy to the texture that you want, just simply pour it in, and that colander's gonna catch all the larger parts. And if you've got lots of sediment around the side, you can put some water in and scratch it away and pour it back on the top there. Give it a little agitation. You can put a bit of pressure in there. If you keep putting more and more pressure on, you're gonna get like a kind of paste of the veggies and the meat come through. That might be a good thing for you or a bad thing, depends what you want. But I'm really happy with this. That's been resting for two hours. You're also gonna get resting juices. It's very normal to have a little bit of kind of foam coming to the top. Um, so a little quick way to be able to take that off is just take your pan to the side of the heat source. And if you come and have a look now, what that'll do is it'll boil up on one side and push the scum to one side. And just watch me here. I'll just go in and just touch the side and you're left with the most fantastic, wonderful gravy. This now is ready for you to simmer. You can cool it down, heat it up. Uh, remember, this is gonna bring heat to the plate, whether it's veggies, you know, your carved meats uh, and roast potatoes. So there you go, the perfect gravy. The only thing to do now is just have a little try. Beautiful, beautiful gravy that will make people very, very happy. We're gonna do jerk ham. Say jerk ham. Jerk ham. No, say jerk ham. Jerk ham. We're gonna do oh, jerk ham. Good. Flavor of Jamaica. We're gonna big it up, right? I've got these little hocks and there's enough meat on there for two and a half portions, right? Obviously they're hammed, so they've been salted. So I've had these in water overnight. So what we're gonna do is make our jerk spice. So mummy, I would like to pass you things. You're gonna be in charge of the processor over there. This is the recipe for jerk. Three cloves of garlic go straight into the processor, together with three shallots, three sprigs of thyme, and up to three scotch bonnets. Woo! Whack in three bay leaves, three little cloves and three level teaspoons of sea salt and three heaped teaspoons of allspice. About three teaspoons of honey, three tablespoons of, of rum, 
and then the same of vinegar. Now we're going to whiz that up, so just press on, Mama. And pour in the three tablespoons of olive oil and blitz, blitz, blitz. So, Mum, put these gloves on, right, and let's have a little massage. Um, I'm going to pour the jerk over the hocks here, and Mum will perform this incredible massage that she does. Um, <laughs> He makes it all up. <laughs> <laughs> when the hop cooks up low and slow, the meat pulls away like hunks, all tender and delicious. So I'm going to whack these in the oven. These can go in. And like my darling Delia used to say, here's one I made earlier. Now, with clean hands, you go back in, and you can see how the meat pulled away from the bone. It's just tender. It's melting your mouth. We can give it a little drizzle of olive oil, Mum. You know, just the juice of one or two. Have a little drizzle, Mum. I need to drizzle it over there. Yes, please, Tiger. <laughs> a little bit of clementine juice. Mum, chuck us a pan, sweetheart. Reheating the pulled hock will soften the fats that have hardened in the fridge and moisten and caramelise the meat. Team up with the delicious salad. I love cold and sweet clementines, along with some crunchy radish and romaine lettuce. Really, really delicious and delightful. A little bit of watercress. There we go. And at this stage in the game, we can just have a little drizzle up. Some olive oil and balsamic vinegar. A little pinch of salt, but not too much because you've got the seasoned, you know, crispy ham. And then transform this delicious warm salad with a kiss of some fresh pomegranate capsules. <laughs> so there you go, you've got the beautiful jerk warm salad. That was brilliant, Mum. Thanks so much for coming. That was really good. <laughs> Do you want to have a brandy? Lovely people, I'm going to show you how to make Hasselback potatoes. Beautiful, roast, crispy skin potatoes. Cut in such a way that they all open up, fan up, and you can flavour them in the most beautiful way. I've done this for my new cookbook, uh, Jamie's Christmas, and you can make this any time of the year. It's really a principle. It's not just potatoes, guys. Parsnips, carrots. Today, I am brave enough to have two helpers. My little boy buddy. OK, and this is Petal. Say hello. Hello. Have you ever heard the word Hasselback? No, didn't think so. So I am going to get two of my beautiful spoons. I'm going to lay them down. I'm going to place the potato in between the gap to stop the knife going all the way through. So I'm going to make little slices every half a centimetre, all the way down to the little spoon. And this means that you don't slip. It's really got a perfect effect. Come and have a little look here. So you can see what we've done here is create kind of like a crazy little open texture. Now, the great thing about that is it makes more surface area, which means it's more crispy, and I can put flavoured oils in there. What do you think of that, kids? Impressed? I am using a Maris Piper potato because it's really great for roasting, fluffy on the inside, crispy on the outside, and that's exactly what you want in a roast potato or a Hasselback. I'm going to put the potatoes into the tray, and these lovely kids are going to show you how to make a flavoured Oil. So, guys, do you know what herb this is? Thyme. Good lad. So I'm going to put a pinch of salt in here to create not just seasoning for this, but an abrasive kind of environment. And then I'm going to give this to Petal. Hello. So, Petal, if you can bash the living daylights out of that. Create a mush for Daddy. And that immediately it sort of breaks down the herb itself, releases the oils, the flavour and it's going to give you incredible smell. So once you've got a mush, then we can add our fat. That could be butter, turkey drippings or olive oil. So if you can just muggle that slowly around in circles. I'm going to add some oil to this and this is going to transmit all those amazing flavours. So what we want to do now is make sure all the cut sides are facing up. Then we're going to pour this amazing oil. Look at the colour, guys. Look at the colour. And we'll just give it a toss. And of course, they're absorbing and taking on all of that beautiful flavour. And I'm going to put the cut side facing up. So I'm going to pop this in the oven. They're going to make a really good potato, but I want to add to it. We're going to take some leftover bread, brown or white. Do you know what nuts these are? I bet you don't. Hazelnuts. Yeah, it is hazelnuts. Oh. Hazelnuts is the nut of choice, but you could use almonds. Take some more of the time. I'm going to pop these in the oven. What you've got is really, really crispy bread now, and you can see how the skins on the hazelnuts have just kind of come off and they've toasted. Basically, we've created flavour and texture, okay? There's a nice little tip to come. These potatoes here have had 45-odd minutes, and I'm going to use a little brush 
thyme, olive oil, Hasselback potatoes. Now, my little helper, can you take this tray, it's not hot, and just pour it in here. Are you tall enough to get in there? It's quite a big ask. Let's help you. And then we're gonna put some cheese in there. So, just a few little knobs of cheese. So, if I close this, can you turn the button, please? You can have them chunky, or you can have them quite fine. And then sprinkle this on top. I'm gonna to put this back in the oven now. About 15 more minutes until gnarly and crispy and golden and sizzling and delicious. Look at that. A great Hasselback potato, but it's not just potatoes, guys. Parsnips, carrots, absolutely beautiful. So have fun with it. Let's plate these sexy fellows up. Unbelievable, joyful. This is what you're getting, guys. Super crispy, and then on the inside, super soft, super fluffy, and of course it's, it's absorbed all those beautiful fats and flavor from the thyme. Delicious. Hello, lovely people. Okay, I'm gonna do a little crash course on carving a turkey, because when you do carve one of these, which also applies to duck, goose, or chicken, it's a really beautiful thing. So let's go through the very basics. This is the way that I do it. First up, you've got the wings here, which is beautiful sweet meat. We're gonna take the wing off first. Pull the wing, help it along just to remove it, and at the ball joint, just click that off. You can either put that in your gravy, uh, but actually I know people love this. They really love this. It's the sweetest, most gorgeous meat in the whole bird. There's a second part of the wing here, which goes into the breast. Look at the juice coming out, guys. And we can just kind of bust that. You can see where the ball joint is. Just remove that, like that, and that'll come out gorgeous. There's the wings. We're gonna go in with the thighs now. The breast comes around here like that. Then there's this little bit of skin in the middle. We'll just lightly cut that, and then we can just favor it open. So guys, just with the tip of the knife, remove this whole leg. Then we're on to the breast action. We want a nice sharp knife. Use the length of your carving knife and sort of slow Carves, take your time, really nice and juicy. So I'm very, very pleased with that. You're getting the lovely sort of sweeter meat that's had slightly less access to the heat of the oven. And then you've got the top, which has been roasted up gorgeously. You've got that crispy skin, look at that. When it starts to get awkward, I tend to flip it around to the other side. And then that last bit of meat on the carcass, that's fine, because that's the bit we'll strip off the next day for sandwiches and bits and pieces like that. What you can do is just put a lick of gravy over what you've done here. So it's the gravy that keeps this piping hot, okay? And remember, even after two hours, that meat was nice and hot. This is method number one. There's a second way. I'm not saying it's better or worse, it's just different. We're gonna take a lovely turkey, okay? We're gonna whip off the wing, just like we did last time. That wing comes off nice and easy. So here, we're gonna go in between the breasts, here, you can feel it, and the drumstick, okay? We'll cut in the middle of there, really nicely. You can see the juice coming out. So of course, we can pull that leg away. We've removed the wing and the leg, just like last time, okay? Exactly the same. Then you've got a little bone that goes down here. You can see it in between the two breasts. Feel that bone, put your knife gently in the middle. Just cut the breast off the bone. It's very simple. It kind of looks technical, but it's really not. You're just, it's the same as taking a chicken breast off a chicken. Look at that, you've got the whole lovely breast coming off. What we've got here is we've got our leftover and we'll use those, but what we've got here is a whole chunk of breast. And what's lovely is we can then portion control it very differently. We can slice it up and some people just prefer this. You can go for a slightly thicker slice You've got the roasted skin and the most roasted meat on the outside, and you've got that sweeter meat that's near the carcass on the bottom. So it's really nice for you guys to have the option. Look at that, guys. You can go right over here, fan it out like this. You can redress it. People quite like that. Just a little bit of gravy, just to keep it super, super hot. And of course, you serve gravy at the table as well. 
So there you go guys, two methods of carving a turkey. The old school method at the table or the breast off and portion control method. They're both good, you pick what's good for you. But more to the point, have a little look before you do the big carve up. Good luck, have a wonderful, wonderful meal. I'm taking you back into my archive for an absolute classic. Perfect roast potatoes. I've been perfecting my way of cooking them for years. First off, I always parboil them for about 10 minutes in salted boiling water. Drain them and then a bit of a toss in the colander will help fluff up the edges even more. Next up, you need the fat. Extra virgin olive oil is the healthiest option and will give you a lovely golden crunch. Or you could use butter for a slightly thicker, sweeter crunch. Or if you really want to go all out, you can use goose fat for the thickest crunch of all. The key is always do them in a single layer in the roasting tray and give them a good season with salt and pepper. I'm going to cook this for half an hour at about 190 degrees Celsius, 375 Fahrenheit, until about lightly golden. And then I'm going to show you what to do with the masher, and that's going to make the ultimate roast potato. After half an hour, we're ready for some masher magic. So what I want to do is I want to increase the surface area the potato has on the bottom of the pan. So I'm going to do that by going around these and just squashing them. I'm telling you, give this a try and you won't regret it. Along with the maximum crunch factor, you want maximum flavour. And I'm adding the herbs now because what I've worked out is that if you put them in at the beginning, yes, you get some good flavour, but the herbs go black and they're kind of not that nice to eat. But if you put them in halfway through, you get much more of a perfume of the herbs. First up, we've got some rosemary. Coat that with a drop of olive oil. And a splash of vinegar. Bear with me, the vinegar will totally cook away, but it's going to give the potato like a kick. And then some garlic here. This is about your personal touch, so put in what you like. You could also try thyme with garlic and bay. Or even some sage, garlic and clementine zest for another Christmassy twist. And then once you've done that, we're going to pop these back in the oven for about 25 minutes, 30 minutes, or until perfect to your eye. But half an hour's a good one, and then when you see those babies and taste them, best. Best, best roast potatoes in the world. And here they are. Listen. Beautifully. Look at how fluffy that is in the middle. Just almost falling apart. Let's have a try. Oh, really good. Today is a great day because we are making a nut roast. And for me, the nut roast is about a beautiful dinner, a beautiful meal, textures, contrast, sweetness, savouriness. It's a wonderful opportunity to love your veg. Uh, we're using some interesting things like quinoa, nuts, chestnuts, spices, dried fruit, and I'm gonna put it together with a sauce and some melted cheese and lovely herbs. You're gonna love it. Okay, so first job, preheat your oven to 180 degrees Celsius, 350 Fahrenheit. Next, let's chop up the squash. I wanna just dice up the squash into roughly one centimetre chunks. I'm going to add a couple of tablespoons of oil. Let's get the squash straight in. We're not going to completely cook stuff in the pan. We're just going to take the rawness out and start sharing some flavours. I'm using vac pack chestnuts here. You can get them in all the supermarkets. And if you put them in whole and bring them back to life by roasting them um, with things like rosemary, okay, they're absolutely delicious. I want one onion. Now let's just finely chop that. Two cloves of garlic. Celery. We definitely want to start the process of seasoning with sea salt and pepper. About half a teaspoon of cayenne. A little pinch of smoked paprika. I want one level teaspoon of dried oregano. So I'm just going to quite crudely cut up a lovely couple of filled mushrooms about 40 grams of butter. Uh, just a little bit of lemon zest gives a really nice contrast. Our veg here is off the heat now. Over here, we've got 100 grams of mixed nuts, Brazils, walnuts, hazelnuts, cashew nuts. Next job, I need to bash my nuts, which is a lovely opportunity for you to get all the frustration in your life out, but with good reason and purpose. Ah, nice. Bashed up nuts. I'm going to put this into the bowl. Next in with the quinoa and the dry fruit. 
four lovely large free range eggs. Obviously the eggs are gonna really help to bind the dish. We're gonna go straight in like that. All the juices and we'll mix it up. I've rubbed this dish um, with butter and I've just lined it with some greaseproof paper just to make it doubly safe that it just pops out nice and easy. So I'm just gonna pour this in with the nut roast like this. Squeeze as much as you can into there. So now I'm gonna whack this in the oven for 45 to 50 minutes. I'm gonna cook that until it goes golden and crisp and gorgeous. Then next, I'm gonna show you how to make a brilliant sauce that I'm gonna sit that on. So it's kind of cooking into each other with some melted cheese, herbs, and this sauce is called Salsa Rosa Picante. It's gorgeous. So I'm gonna put a little olive oil into the tray. I'm gonna get two chilies. I'm gonna prick it. If you don't prick it, they'll explode in your face. And I just wanna put the chilies in whole. I'm also gonna go in with a stick of cinnamon, some garlic, just two cloves. I'm just gonna get a small onion here, cut it into quarters and then into eighths. I'm gonna go for this next part of the recipe with some thyme and just take the lovely little leaves off the stalk. I'm gonna put this on top of the nut roast. Just move that thyme around so it's coated in the fat and then it's gonna crispen up and go gorgeous. I'm gonna put it to one side, out of the heat. Go in with my tomatoes. What we can also do is add just a little bit of balsamic vinegar, one tablespoon. And I'll turn the heat down to really low, simmer it for 10, 50, 20 minutes to really develop the flavors. And then I'll show you what to do with the nut roast next. It's gonna be gorgeous. Look at that. Tip it onto its side, like so. We can take that greaseproof paper off, place this in to this amazing sauce. And I'm just gonna grate some nice bits of cheddar and that's gonna give it amazing flavor. It'll obviously melt and go gorgeous. We can then put our chili on the top, put the cinnamon on the top as well. I've got those thyme tips, remember? Put that over the whole tray. Pop it back in the oven now for about 10 minutes. Okay, so let's have a little look at that. I purposefully let the grated cheese go over the edges and let the tomato sauce cook up the sides. I'm gonna get myself a nice plate some mashed potato, let's get some lovely seasonal kale. Look at that, gorgeous. Proper comfort food. Get that lovely thick sauce and just put it over one side of the nut loaf, over the kale, with a little new season olive oil. It is an absolute dream. There you go, it is delicious. I'm gonna try it. Of course you've got the crispy bits here, the soft bits there, all those lovely veggies. Let's get right in there with the salsa rosa picante. Mmm, absolutely delicious guys. So until next time, happy cooking. As it's Christmas, I want to give you some winning combinations that give you a big bang for your buck every single time. Smoked salmon, horseradish, everyday cress and a bit of lemon, brilliant. Get some creme fraiche or yogurt, get some regular horseradish, nice and hot. Season with a little bit of salt and pepper and a little squeeze of lemon juice. Have a little taste, make sure it really kicks a good punch, make sure it's hot enough. Get some ciabatta sliced, about a centimetre thick, or any toast, whack it in a toaster or on a griddle pan, then drizzle with a little extra virgin olive oil. Then get yourself some beautiful smoked salmon and just lay it beautifully, sort of like waves on the bottom like that. So simple, so good. Horseradish creme fraiche. Some old school retro crest. And then finish with a little olive oil and a squeeze of lemon. So there you go guys, a beautiful Christmas crustini. A winner every single time. Give it a go, you'll love it. Hi guys, hope you're well. Jamie Oliver here. I am gonna give you my recipe for a great Christmas dessert. It's indulgent, delicious, beautiful to see. It is from my new Christmas cookbook, Banoffee Alaska. It's brilliant for Christmas because you can do bits ahead and put it in the freezer. And then when it goes out, it's stunning. First up, short crust sweet pastry. I've got plain flour, 200 grams. And then the other element of flour is almond flour. 
Then I'm gonna flavor it subtly with a fine grater and half an orange. One egg goes in, really lovely rich yolks, look at that. Then I'm gonna go in with a pack of butter, about 150 grams, a sort of generous pinch of salt in here. We're gonna buzz it up. As soon as it comes together, onto a table, and I'm just gonna hug it. I don't wanna overwork it. I don't want my hot hands to sort of affect it. We'll wrap that up, pop that in the fridge to relax. On there is lovely pastry that I did about an hour ago. I've rubbed this 25 centimetre mould with some butter, and I'm just gonna dust a nice clean surface and just use a rolling pin or some cling film just to roll this out. So we'll roll this up now. Just let it kind of go in. If something breaks, you can just plug it and fix it. So once you've done that, get a little fork and we'll just put a few little holes. This will just relieve any steam that builds up. Just use some greaseproof paper or some cling film. If you're gonna use cling film, use the CookSafe cling film, the, the non-PVC stuff. Some people have baking beans. I have baking rice, okay? So just push that down. Then just loosely put this over like that. And we're gonna cook this for 10 minutes at 180 degrees Celsius. And then after it's done that, what I'll do is remove the cling film and the rice and let it have another sort of five to 10 minutes so it looks like this. What I'm gonna use is some beautiful dolce de leche, right? We'll just spoon that out. And then about 10 minutes ago, I got some lovely vanilla ice cream out the freezer and into the fridge. And I'm gonna make a layer of ice cream and just break it up. So I'm gonna put this in the freezer and then I'll show you what to do next. So Italian meringue. We're gonna go in with 300 grams of sugar. We're gonna go in with 80 millilitres of water. We just give it a little shake around, pop it on a medium high heat. Then I'm gonna use a sugar thermometer. Now you can get these online, easy peasy. We're gonna take it to 110 degrees Celsius and then turn it down and let it creep up to 120. I need five eggs, guys. Crack the eggs into a dish. You want pure egg whites, no egg yolks, okay? You don't want to bust them, so be gentle. We need a clean bowl for our mixer and clean whisk. The five egg whites go in. I'm gonna put a pinch of salt in here. Okay, so let's get that down. Full whack. So we've got the sugar at 120 degrees Celsius, and then we are going to carefully pour it into the machine. Of course, it's really, really hot. So it's immediately cooking the egg whites and it's gonna give you that incredible cooked, bouncy meringue. Let this whisk for about 10 minutes to cool down and make it silky smooth. This is what you get at the end of this beautiful journey. Last bit is that incredible kind of hit of lovely, silky smooth banana with the caramel. So I'm gonna get two, cut them at an angle about half a centimetre, a centimetre thick. I'm gonna get two parts of lime. We use the zest from a little fine grater. Then I'm gonna roll just to get the juices going. Cut it in half and then the lime juice over the banana. So, we've got it frozen. It's hard. We've got an oven on full whack, about 220. We're gonna put the banana over the top and let's just pile our meringue on top. Silky smooth. I'm just gonna move the meringue in and around. You can try and create some wispy ends. And then last but not least, a little drizzle of camp coffee, which is coffee flavored essence, right? Just ripple it through. There she is. So we're gonna put this in at 220 degrees Celsius for about four minutes. She's looking mighty fine. Get yourself a little bowl or something like that and take this over, rest it on top, and it will just pop straight out like that. Look at that. Let's get into this beautiful dessert, into the middle, gorgeous. Use your knife underneath the slice that you've created. We've got the lovely orange and almond crumbly biscuit base. We've got the caramel layer here. We've got the ice cream, the banana and lime, and then that beautiful coffee tainted Italian meringue. It's hot on the outside and around the biscuit base, and it's just starting to melt in the middle. It's a perfect temperature. It's so good. Welcome back to my fabulous festive food combos. I've got beautiful baked cheese flavored with rosemary and garlic, some lovely roasted croutons, and a little dip of sour cranberry and some crushed nuts. Gorgeous. Dead simple. First things first, we're gonna do some baked cheese. Uh, what I'm gonna do is get a knife and just score around the top first, and then just shave it off like that. Then what we're gonna do is add some fresh rosemary. 
Get yourself some garlic and cut it into little slices and just plonk the garlic into the cheese. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna bake this in an oven at 180 for about 20 minutes until golden and it's gonna be fantastic. I'm just gonna drizzle that with a little olive oil and you see what happens. So once that gets cooked, it looks something like this. It's almost like a sea of lava cheese. So I want something to dip into it. Dead simple, go and get yourself a rosemary skewer like this, okay? Then get some leftover stale bread and just tear it up what I want you to do is thread on your little bits of bread, do yourself about five or six of these, or however many people you've got, and bake them both together at the same time, about 15 to 20 minutes. These will go golden and crisp. This will go oozy like it has done. This is what you get. Beautiful little roasted toasties. Takes no time at all. And to add on again, I've got some leftover uh, sour cranberries and some sort of nuts from the nut basket that you just crush up. Just finely chop it all. And what I love to do, just pull off one of these bits of toast, dip that straight into your sort of bath of melty, oozy cheese. Look at that. We dip that into our sour cranberries and chopped up nuts. And that really is a little mouthful of heaven. Even though it's a 1980s trick, it's never boring. People go crazy for it. There'll be nothing left. Brilliant. And I want to do a dish that is so, so simple to put together and makes it look like you've been cooking for hours and hours and hours. This is three kilos. Beautiful bit of free range pork. Look at that. The butchers scored the skin and taken the skin off. Get a nice gorgeous covering of sea salt, pepper and whole fennel seeds on your joint. And then just a little bit of olive oil. Just to get things going, I'm just going to score that fat on this side and that lets the flavour in as well. And I'm just going to rub it. Really, really nice, very, very simple. Do the same with the skin as well, and it'll be the best crackling ever. To make incredible treacly onions, slice up six red onions. And let's get that into the pork here. This is pomegranate molasses. It's a kind of syrup of pomegranate juice. It's got that kind of balsamicness. I'm going in heavy with about 150 mils of pomegranate molasses, and matching that amount with red wine vinegar. Put the pork on top, fat side up and cook in the oven for about one hour, 20 minutes at 220 degrees Celsius. And then this skin, I'm gonna put on the bars, straight on the bars, above the pork, so it just gets crackly and it naturally bastes the pork. That's it. Lovely roasted pork and the best crackling ever. Drain the excess fat off the onions and get them in a bowl. The molasses, if you're wondering what the hell it did, is incredible. Let's just try an onion. Oh, it's so good. I've got the cracklings here. I'm just gonna snap it up, crush it. I'm getting quite excited now. Look at that. Whatever you sprinkle that on is gonna bring a big old smile to someone's face. Cut and fan out the pork. To stop it drying out, just drizzle it with some of the juice from the onions. Then pile that board high with all the salad -y bits. So tomatoes, cucumbers, iceberg, mint, crackling, chilli, pork, onions. Come on, man. Whatever you put that on is going to be beautiful. And then pomegranates, OK? These little bad boys here, cut them in half like this. Get your hand like that. Get yourself a spanker and then just spank these pomegranates over the whole thing. Warm up the tortillas in a pan. There's no need to use any oil. It only needs to go in the pan for like 20 seconds. Let's take some of that gorgeous sweet onions. A little the iceberg, some tomatoes, two beautiful pieces of pork. Let's have some cracklings. Hit up the chilies. we like the chilli, yes we do. The mint definitely makes it delicious and fragrant. Pomegranates, wrap it up, even fold the bottom so the juice don't go everywhere. And that, my friend, is a posh pork kebab and that will knock you into next year with style. Welcome back to my fabulous festive food combos. You're gonna love this one. It's stuffed dates with walnuts, thyme, manchego and sandwiched between beautiful chorizo so it goes crispy and smoky. So get yourself some dates. My granddad always used to get dates, keeps him regular. Open them out like this, get yourself a little walnut and just break it in half. Just squeeze the walnut into it and get a nugget of manchego or cheddar or any nice melting cheese and stuff that into that date and you can almost squeeze it back to the shape it came in. Get a nice little pinch of thyme. Thyme, cheese and dates works really, really well. Once you've done that, get a skewer and we're gonna first put on some chorizo, then go through your date 
and then through the chorizo again. And it literally takes seconds to do. I'm gonna do one more. Date, cheese, thyme. Go through the chorizo, through the date, and back with the chorizo. Do yourself a whole load of those up. You can keep them the day before or even the day before that, when you want them. Get your oven on to 250 degrees. Get yourself like an earthenware type dish. Plop a whole load of these in one layer with a few knobs of butter and some sherry vinegar or red wine vinegar. And roast them up for about 10 minutes until crispy and gorgeous. And guess what? Here's one I made earlier. Sizzling and gorgeous, oozy cheese, sweet dates. The chorizo goes crispy and smoky. The dates goes just gorgeous and gooey. The cheese is oozy. A brilliant combo. Your mates will go mad for it. Give it a go. It starts with the fillet of beef. It's so tender. Go and get yourself uh, about 1.2, 1.3 kilos worth. Get your butcher to trim it up. This will easily serve eight people. Give it a nice pinch of sea salt. A little bit of pepper, rosemary and beef are the best friends in the whole wide world. Sprinkle that on the board so there's an even covering and then get that lovely fillet of beef, give it a little press and that's how you get a really nice even seasoning. Add a lug of olive oil, a knob of butter and a sprig of rosemary to a pan on a high heat. Then brown the fillet all over for four minutes. Let's start the chicken liver and mushroom pate. It's really simple. Replace the fat in your beef pan with some fresh olive oil and butter. Go in with two cloves of garlic, two sprigs of rosemary, a chopped red onion, and a pinch of salt. Look at these mushrooms, absolutely beautiful. 600 grams I'm using. Break them up with your hand. Put your mushrooms into the pan with the onion and garlic and cook down for 15 minutes until softened. Then add 100 grams of chicken livers, a dash of Worcestershire sauce, plus a cap full of truffle oil. Cook for three or four minutes, then tip it all onto a board. Oh, the smell is phenomenal. And you can cut this to any texture you want. I am quite happy with that. I'm just gonna go in with a nice big handful of dry breadcrumbs, and that will soak up some of those lovely resting juices from the meat. Next, the puff pastry. But make sure you get a good quality all butter one. I want it to be about the size of a tea towel, about 30 centimetres by 40 centimetres. Keep turning it. Spread the mushroom and chicken liver pate over the pastry, leaving a space around the edges. To make it all stick together, paint a little bit of beaten egg onto the exposed bits of pastry. And roll it up like this. Keep it tight, snug, and then just roll it over again until it's firm. Pinch that edge and push it down. Squash the ends with a fork dipped in flour, then glaze the whole Wellington with egg wash. And to prevent a soggy bottom, I'm gonna give it a two minute blast on the hob before it goes in to cook. Get that in the oven at 210 degrees Celsius for exactly 40 minutes. Put it on the bottom of the oven. I can feel it's nice and crisp, which is lovely. The colors are amazing. After resting the meat for five minutes, I'm ready to serve. Beautiful. Let's load it up with some nice greens and then the gravy. Very exciting. Beef fillet has rested into that mushroom and it's all kind of cooked into each other. There's a real harmony there. Mmm. That is so good. We're going to do a Christmas Sunday using up all the leftover bits of Christmas. We're talking about leftover Christmas pudding. We're talking about leftover hot cranberry sauce. We're talking about nuts chopped up. We've got yogurt, that's in every house. Chocolate, there'll be loads of that around. So basically, just layer it up, mix up the colours, mix up the textures, and I've got some ice cream to go with the hot cranberry sauce. Hot and cold, it's going to be brilliant. Let's do it. A little bit of yogurt. Right in the bottom, some chopped nuts. Then go for some cranberry sauce. Then go for a little slice of clementine. Then we're going to go for some yogurt. This yogurt's had a little bit of vanilla extract put through it and a tiny bit of sugar. Then some more nuts. Then some more Christmas pudding. Then a little bit more hot cranberry sauce. Great flavours, a few more nuts, a few more clementines, 
A little bit more yogurt. There's no rules. Make it up as you go. Try and use up anything nice and delicious that you've got around. Try and ripple that yogurt with the hot cranberry sauce. A little more clementine, a few more nuts. And then to finish it off, just get a spoon and some hot water and do a nice little twist and curl. <laughs> Look at that. And then we're gonna finish it off with a little shaved chocolate. Get yourself a knife and if you just push it towards you like this, you can shave the chocolate or you can grate it. So simple. Not chefy in the slightest, anyone can do it. Bit of clementine leaf, and there you go. Look at those layers. Go right to the bottom, get a bit of everything. Beautiful, simple. A lovely Christmas Sunday, look at those layers. Absolutely gorgeous. Traditional mince pie, I'm over it. And I'll come up with something which has everything that I love about a mince pie and more. What I've got is some pre-bought all-butter puff pastry and I've got some phyllo pastry here as well. Bit of flour, roll it out. Put a bit more flour on there. Who's in control here? Me yeah, I know, me. but no, can I put them some on top That was ice well? and sugar. That was ice and sugar. <laughs> What's the matter with you? Roll it out to about the size of a regular tea towel. It's about three millimetres thick. You get a good quality jar of mincemeat. But what I've got an opportunity to do is I can put some other things in, like the chestnuts that me and Janara have done, and some other sour fruits, like sour cranberries. Now, clementine. And don't you think they need a bit of spice in it? It's got spice in the mincemeat. Do you need a little bit of black peppers, you know? I'm not putting black pepper in mine. No. Why not? Because we're not Italian. We don't want black pepper on our mincemeat. It's a spice, you put. But, um, roll it up into a sausage shape. So what you get is like a little twister. And I was thinking, I want to have another texture. Right. right, so I've got this phyllo pastry, and basically I want it to cover this tray. So I'm gonna lay a sheet here, and I've got some melted butter, just dab that. I wanna put it over this tray, and I want it to be about, I don't know, a couple of inches bigger. And you can be scruffy about this. Don't try and be pretty, don't worry about this. Just hang it over, so just lay it over, roughly. Get the two ends that we're not going to use, push them together. And just use that to gently push the phyllo pastry in, using that as a little bung. A little bit of butter around all the edges, and when it cooks, that phyllo pastry almost becomes like a little tray that it's cooked in. Get a nice handful of almonds, sprinkle them on top, and then the icing sugar. Beautiful. Mm. I put that in the oven for about 25 minutes, 30 minutes, until golden and beautiful. And that, you just wait, will be beautiful. Bravo! That phyllo pastry almost becomes like a little tray that it's cooked in. So I'm going to get some creme fraiche, Gennaro. Just put me about two tablespoons of uh, vanilla sugar in there, big boy. Two and can you grate me some uh, clementine on top? <coughs> Heat your brandy up. Just like a shot. Did you put nothing? I did put a two tablespoons. I didn't have the sugar. How much clementine did you put in? I put a little zest over and a little clementine inside. A whole zest or just a little bit of a clear? Well, look, I put all this. Listen, I know better than what you put inside here. <laughs> just put that lovely flame and fresh in there. Just click it off, you know. For me personally, that is beautiful. And the lovely thing is, you can bespoke it, you can make it your own. This is for me, this is for you. A little bit of icing sugar, oh, that's good, a little boy. bit of holly. Buon Natale. Buon Natale. In Essex we say, up your bum. Up my bum. <laughs>
guys, we're gonna cook turkey. Woo! This is one of the biggest meals of the year, guys. Whether it's Thanksgiving or Christmas time, you need a fail-safe recipe that guarantees perfect results and tastes every single time. Really good, honest gorgeousness. So one of the first things you need to do to guarantee the most amazing succulent roasted turkey is actually get the turkey out of the fridge at least two, two and a half hours before you want to cook it. I always recommend buying a high welfare free range turkey, which is the one that I'm using here. It's not just more ethical, the flavour is incredible. Before we start prepping the bird for roasting, we've got to think ahead a little bit and we want a trivet that's going to make the best gravy ever. We've got three or four little medium sized onions. These are going to roast under the bird, go gorgeously sweet. Some celery, some carrots, you want them quite crude and quite big. Put a little rosemary in there, put a few bay leaves in there. And also this is the opportunity to put in your giblets. The turkey neck is like oxtail. The depth of flavour and the collagen and the gorgeousness and the, oh, it's unbelievable, right? So we're just going to shake that in. That's our trivet, done. If you want to know how to make the most amazing gravy, click the link. I'm going to give you a recipe for basic preparation of a gorgeous bird, okay? You want about half a pack of butter. Most of this will drain off along with the actual natural turkey fat. So just rub it on. There's no sort of polite way to prepare your turkey. So let me just wash my hands. Then we're going to season generously with lovely sea salt. Some nicely ground black pepper. We've got some nutmeg. It just feels like that little edge of Christmas. Half a nutmeg is all you need. Okay, so now let's talk about stuffing. A lot of people ram a load of stuffing in this cavity here. And what that does, it's not a pretty sight, I admit, but what it does is it stops the natural airflow going into the bird and it kind of messes with your cooking times, okay? We want to stuff it from the neck, actually, with about 600 grams to a kilo, depending on the size of your turkey. And then just tuck the skin back under, like that, and look. You would have never have known I'd been there, okay? If you want to see how to make the stuffing for this, click the link. Place your turkey on the trivet. I did say you don't want to fill it up, but just a little clementine, just a little Christmas clementine. Put one or two up there, and of course you can grab some rosemary or thyme um, and get that up there as well. Just give it a little rub, get a little bit of butter on there, shove it in there. It hasn't stopped the air going in, but it will create the opportunity for fragrance and potential and gorgeousness. A thing that I would recommend uh, is a thermometer. Now we're going to push this thermometer into the fattest part of the turkey and just leave it there. It will give you an honest reading about what's happening on the inside of the bird. We want you to be on top of that. Get a little foil. This is going to really help retain juiciness uh, and also protect the skin. And I just expose the thermometer like this. Super, super helpful. My medium sized turkey here is seven kilos on the head. Calculating the cooking times at 35 minutes per kilo. You work out your times guys and get that bird in the oven at 180 degrees Celsius, which is 350 Fahrenheit. Find out more in the description box below. Don't be afraid to go in halfway through the cooking, remove the foil and get a little spoon of fat and just baste the turkey with all those gorgeous cooking juices. Pop the foil back on, and about half an hour before the end of its cooking time, remove the foil for the skin to crispen up. So here you go guys, a beautiful, beautiful turkey. This bird has been out for about half an hour. It's cool enough to pick up, right? We're gonna just pour any juices out, put it onto a warm platter. And you can just put a bit of tin foil over this and a tea towel. Two hours resting is gonna be gorgeous. It's not optional, it's not a luxury, it's essential. So there you go guys, that is my perfect roast turkey. No tears guys, let's get this right. Hello lovely people. Okay, stuffing. Mastering the perfect stuffing. I wanna give you principles that you can use to give you consistency, gorgeousness, deliciousness. Breadcrumbs, onions, sage, there's dried fruit, there's nuts. I want you to put your own stamp on your stuffing. First up, the three basics that you must have. Onions, bread, herb, okay? This will give you a basic stuffing. And the way you take it to the next level is by using beautiful minced pork shoulder. Really, really nice, good, delicious fat. And then over here, you've got the embellishment. Things like lovely chestnuts, whether they're from the vacuum pack or whether they're roasted over a fire, gorgeous and peeled. We've got like 
all those lovely Christmassy kind of nuts that you get, just toasted up and cracked. They're beautiful in the stuffing, really good. Then dried fruit, just a tiny little surprise of sweetness and sourness. Dried cranberries, apricot, very good. Then a little bit of dried chili, just to give a background kind of hum. No, I don't want it to be hot. Nutmeg, which is a classic, and a little cinnamon. Let's go in with um, a little olive oil and a little knob of butter. What we want to do is start to fry off the fragrant things, like the sage. This is going to be enough for this whole dish, plus a nice kind of 500 gram ball that will go up the back of the turkey or in the chicken or in your sort of roast pork. Slice it through the leaves, get rid of these stalks. Go in with about two tablespoons of olive oil, butter, uh, a little chili, a pinch of cinnamon, and then nutmeg. Now the reason for this is you're waking up all those spices. Half a nutmeg goes in. We can turn the heat up. So the first thing that's gonna happen, spicy, oily, buttery, fat in there, the sage goes in, and we've got that on a medium heat, just finely chopped, two or three onions. The onions will go lovely and sweet. So onions into the sage, look, beautiful. Okay, you don't have to make them super sweet or caramelized, just soften them up. Um, so give them a shake every now and again. You know, meat's always been expensive, so the point of a stuffing was to add flavor, make it exciting, have different textures, but also stretch a little meat a long way. We'll lightly season with salt, pepper. So guys, turn this off now, uh, and let that cool down. So you can put this in a kind of dish now. Give it five, 10 minutes, let's get it nice and cool. If you look at the one and a half kilos of pork shoulder, let's put this into a bowl. That's gonna be enough to put half a kilo up the back of your turkey or in your chicken or you know rubbed across the pork loin before you roll it up and then you're gonna have a kilo to make nice and crispy. You want two or three big handfuls of bread to kind of stretch the meat a lot further. We've got chestnuts here. So these are vacuum packed chestnuts guys, you can get these in the supermarkets but you could use other nuts as well. You can just kind of bust some up in your hand. Leave a couple hole like that. Things like apricots are just gorgeous. And then things like the dried cranberries, totally cool. Not much, just a few. And with the apricots, we'll just run our knife through it, then we'll put it in. So when your onions are fully cooled down, add them to your bowl and mix it up. Scrunch it in your hands. Of course you can use a spoon if you want to, but to be honest, it's much better to get stuck in. If that's just minced pork shoulder, then you will need to season. Good couple of pinches of salt and pepper. When you work it with your hand like this, just makes it bind nicely. So what I like to do now is take about 500 grams of this stuffing, it's about one third of it, and I'll put this into a dish like that. And this I will stuff in the turkey. I'll only stuff it in the neck, that little flap of skin, you can put it underneath. Don't put it in the carcass, because that's gonna slow down the cooking, but that will be kind of blonde and juicy. It will flavor the meat, the meat will flavor it, and it will flavor the tray that will flavor your gravy. You see where we're going? And then with this nice big old chunk here, add this to the tray here, and then what I love to do is just push it right into the edges. When it cooks, it does shrink a little bit, so you can kind of push the stuffing up the edge. Just gonna wash my hands, just take a few little leaves, on the top, you could mix it up, have a blend, bits of chestnut and a few cranberries, you know, cause you're kind of storytelling on the top. And I just think it's really exciting. And then a tiny bit of olive oil, just so that sage goes from being dry and horrible and it'll go crispy and gorgeous. Just pat your little sage leaves, look at the color. You can imagine the flavor, can't you? It's gonna be amazing. I have a stuffing that's cooked already. Gnarly, crispy, gorgeous. Have a little try. Oh, 